Did Hans Zimmer ruin movie music? So, on this channel, I've talked a lot about movie music. I love movie music. In my very first video, I explained that there are two kinds of scores, the classical score and the modern score. The classical score used different composers and orchestras and ultimately created all kinds of different sounds. The modern score is highly influenced by minimalism, a form of classical music that is simple, often tonal, repetitive, and rhythmic. Wikipedia describes it as follows. Prominent features of minimalist music include repetitive patterns or pulses, steady drones, consonant harmony, and reiteration of musical phrases or smaller units. Examples are Inception, The Dark Knight Trilogy, Blade Runner 2049, Man of Steel, Batman vs. Superman, and many more. All of these scores have one big similarity. They are composed by Hans Zimmer. That is because he is the almighty reigning king of the modern minimalist score. I love his music. I did, however, say in my first video that I don't really think a score that is essentially just tones and background music deserves as much credit as a score by a composer like John Williams, who writes incredibly complex orchestral songs with incredibly strong melodies and themes. For the best reference, look up John Williams' Superman theme, then Hans Zimmer's Superman theme, then come back to this video. You'll have heard that Williams chose to write a march that sounds like something other musicians would, and do, study. Meanwhile, Zimmer's Superman theme is emotional, evocative, and builds to an epic climax. But try to hum it. It's a lot harder. That's because it's so simple. There are so few notes actually there. I love both themes and both composers. The problem of sorts is that Williams' music is fading away and being entirely replaced by music similar to Zimmer's. That is what I'd like to talk about here. Since I'm weird, I was reading the credits for the movie Something's Gotta Give. I knew the music was by Hans Zimmer and I loved it. It was light, breezy, sweet, and jazzy. Then the credits got to the music department and I noticed that there was additional music by seven different composers. This is because when you hire Hans Zimmer, you don't just hire Hans Zimmer. You hire Remote Control Productions. Remote Control Productions is Hans Zimmer's film score company. All the composers who work there are being mentored by or working alongside Hans Zimmer. So when Hans Zimmer writes a score, all these composers help. One interviewee said that Zimmer writes all the themes. All the main pieces are by him and to be stuck to. But pieces of the movie will be allocated to different composers who are to take the theme and apply it to their section of the movie. For the record, I have no idea if this is exactly how it works, although I did read that this is exactly what was done for the Pirates of the Caribbean score. Caribbean, Caribbean, I don't know. I actually think this is cool. Zimmer is advancing the careers of a lot of musicians. Almost every single composer who has worked under or alongside Zimmer has gone on to have an incredibly productive career. Many of them are also considered famous composers like Zimmer himself. So I think this is really cool. Now for the negative. First is the fact that many people think the music, well, sucks. The following is from the controversy section of Remote Control Productions Wikipedia page. Quote, numerous members of the International Film Music Critics Association have attributed Remote Control Productions of being partly responsible for a supposed degradation in mainstream film score production. Christian Clemenson of Film Tracks frequently questions Zimmer's constant use of ghostwriters and writing music using a lowest common denominator approach. End quote. I think she's referring to the simplicity. For example, Batman's theme in the Dark Knight trilogy, which also had James Newton Howard working on it, had only two notes. Or she's making my earlier argument. Classical, more complex scores deserve more credit. So who cares? Well, Hollywood does. The second negative is that this simple style of music has taken over the movies. Jonathan Broxton of Movie Music UK remarked, quote, 
what I hate is the way in which Remote Control Studios has virtually taken over the upper echelons of the film music world to the detriment of other independent composers who can't catch a break. Five of the 15 highest grossing films at the U.S. box office in 2009 and seven of the 15 highest grossing films in 2008 were scored by Zimmer or someone who used to work for him. Such is their utter dominance of the blockbuster sound that producers and directors wanting a piece of the box office pie return time after time to the studio, not for new or innovative music, but for another variation on the last hit movie's score, one which won't upset the film's target demographic and creativity be damned. End quote. What he's saying is, Hollywood wants everything to sound like Hans Zimmer's music. And this is easy, since most of the composers working are or were mentored by Zimmer. The result is a sea of composers who sound like Zimmer, but can't create any of his stronger themes. So now you've got all this forgettable music that just sounds like a crappy version of something that Zimmer did in a previous movie. I think all that is true. If you were an alien and you came to Earth and started looking through our movie music, you'd start with the golden age of Hollywood. You'd see that the music was trying to model classical composers who composed the greatest music humans ever made. And they did a pretty good job. Push ahead to 60s, 70s, and 80s, and you'd see that the music was still amazing. Maybe even better, since so many other forms of popular music had found their way into movie scores but push ahead to the early 2000s, and a lot of it's just noise. Don't get me wrong, I like ambient music. When I'm working or writing, I like music that musical innovator Brian Eno would call, quote, as ignorable as it is interesting, end quote. But when all the music is like this, what happens when you have a director who says, I need a classical score with extremely strong themes, like something by John Williams or James Horner. Will there be any composers who can step up to the plate? Will there be any composers who even know how to? Or will the standard have been reduced to either classical minimalism or Hans Zimmer ripoff? That is what a lot of people who study music, love music, or make music are worried about. Once again, returning to my first video, I referenced an interview with James Horner, who, in my opinion, is one of the few composers who came close to John Williams when it comes to memorable and or beautiful movie music. Near the end of his life, which was cut short from a tragic plane crash, he had mostly retired, only taking projects that really interested him. One of the frustrations he cited was that people don't want classical music anymore. They want background music. They think themes are, quote, old-fashioned, end quote. He said that he's even worked with directors who asked him to remove the themes from the score. He mentions that James Cameron asked him to do something along these lines for the Avatar score. Horner had written strong and identifiable themes as he had done for Titanic, but Cameron said, this isn't fucking Titanic. At one point, the interviewer asked him about the score for The Hurt Locker, which he was nominated alongside of at the Oscars. The interviewer said that when he talked to the composers, they were surprised they were nominated. They felt their score was so integrated into the sound design that it wasn't really a musical score anymore. Side note, Avatar and Hurt Locker both lost the 82nd Annual Academy Award nomination for Best Score to Michael Giacchino's Up, an extremely classical thematic score. The point of a large part of the interview was that today's music is lesser and getting even lesser than. Does the music from Hans Zimmer and Remote Control Studios have something to do with this? Now that we're through with the negatives, I'd like to say that I don't think so. I think music is moving in this direction regardless of Hans Zimmer, and he's just trying to do his job as best he can in a cutthroat business. I think the problem lies with the filmmakers and us. The filmmakers have pushed for simple music and we've accepted it. Between them and us, it's popular. What's adding fuel to the flame is the temp score. In one interview, Dan 
Danny Elfman referred to the temp score as the, quote, bane of my existence, end quote. In fact, he quit working on Spider-Man 2 because the director Sam Raimi kept pushing for him to make a piece of his score more like the temp score. In case I've lost you, a temp score is the temporary score the filmmakers use to help them in editing. They then turn this cut of the movie over to the composer so that he can use the music as a guide. Basically, I want the music for this scene to sound like that. Right there is the reason so much music sounds the same. Hans Zimmer writes a phenomenal score for Inception, and then suddenly every movie has a moment where the music sounds strangely like time from the Inception soundtrack. Watch the end of Captain Phillips and see if you can spot the song. It's bordering on plagiarism. In fact, if you've listened to a lot of movie scores, it's becoming easier and easier to hear what a movie was tempted with. So it's not Zimmer's fault. When the Beatles went psychedelic, everyone else followed. When Michael Jackson started using a line of backup dancers in his music videos, everyone else followed. When Hans Zimmer presented a revolutionary new style of film score, everyone followed. As for him just trying to do his job as best he can, I really believe this is true. To prove this, I'm now going to reference an article by Michael A. Levine. If you're as interested in this as I am, I urge you to read the article. The link is behindtheaudio.com forward slash 2013 forward slash 07 forward slash Hans dash Zimmer forward slash. The article is titled, Why Hans Zimmer Got the Job You Wanted and You Didn't. I wish Google would recommend articles like this rather than the absolute garbage clickbait articles that it usually recommends to me. Anyway, Michael Levine actually worked for Hans Zimmer for eight years and worked right at Remote Control Studios for five. The article is 100% defending Zimmer. The final point he makes is that this is a cutthroat business. The studios and filmmakers put an unreasonable amount of pressure on you, changing directions and music, further tightening the already too tight schedule they've given you to write a score. Returning to James Horner, he actually was so frustrated by the outrageously complex last minute changes he was asked to make to the Aliens score that he vowed to never work with director James Cameron again. They eventually made up, but it draws more attention to the pattern. Levine references Howard Shore, Mark Shaman, Maurice Jarre, Gabrielle Yared, Bernard Herrmann, and should have referenced Alan Silvestri, all as composers who were fired. Quote, In each case, they were fired because the studio or director lost faith that they could shift direction quickly enough once their original approach was rejected. In 150 plus films, this has never happened to Hans. In other words, Hans Zimmer does not get fired. He delivers, even when there is a ridiculous time crunch. How does he do this? With the help of remote control studios. Another article features Zimmer discussing ghostwriters and the contributions of others directly. You can read it at outlierstudios.co forward slash I-N-T-R-E-S forward slash H-Z on giving credit. At the end of the article, he states, quote, The movie business is a cruel and shallow money trench, a long plastic hallway where thieves and pimps run free and good men die like dogs. There's also a negative side. End quote. In conclusion, I do not think that Hans Zimmer ruined movie music. I think he did his job as best he could. The filmmakers and composers who all produced shallow replicants of his music are far more to blame. And it's not all bad. Composers like Johan Johansson have crafted truly amazing music with a minimalist palette. It's up to other filmmakers and composers to bring a new style and push music into a different direction. Hopefully a new and more complex direction. For the record, my eyes are on Andrew Cote who composed some of the music for the Orville. But he doesn't sound anything like Hans Zimmer, so he probably won't get a job on a major movie. Do you see the problem here? To wrap this up, I'd like to give an afterword to this essay. The essay was finished here. Then I came across a video on the YouTube channel, Cue the Music. The 
video is of James Horner giving a guest lecture at UCLA in 1992. In this video, he discusses many of the things I previously discussed in this essay, one topic of which made me consider that I may have come to the wrong conclusion. First, he discusses the temp score. He explains that in the movie Glory, the director asked him to make a piece of music so close to the temp score that James Horner felt it was plagiarism. Horner says that he was upset with this, but did as the director asked. Lawyers were brought in, and he eventually made it slightly less like the temp score, but the end result was still, arguably, plagiarism. The bitch of it is that the score for Glory is one most commonly discussed when people point out that Horner plagiarized other people's music, but this was at the demands of the director. So what is Horner to do? Do his job as best he can? or quit and reduce his chances of getting work in the future. This supports my argument that Zimmer and the composers that have followed are only doing their job. I hope more of them have the courage to quit, as Danny Elfman did on Spider-Man 2. But I also hope that more directors have the courage to allow a composer to create something new, rather than copying music that already was. The other solution is to go the Tarantino route. Almost all of Tarantino's movies are scored with pre-existing music, most of which is from old movies. Another director who was famous for this was Stanley Kubrick. Kubrick famously discarded the entire score for 2001 A Space Odyssey and almost the entire score for The Shining in favor of the temp score. Both composers publicly criticized Kubrick for his decision and many have agreed with their criticism. I, however, think that Kubrick did the right thing. If you can get the rights to the temp score, you'd rather not part with it. And the composer's score is not what you want, then why force one composer to copy another? Maybe composers could create their own original material, and directors could get the rights to the music afterwards. This is what was done for Shutter Island. The entire score is not a freshly created score. It is a compilation of pre-existing music that was pieced together to perfectly fit the movie. Most of the songs that are in the movie are so well used that if you heard them separately, you would identify them as a theme from Shutter Island. For example, This Bitter Earth on the Nature of Daylight by Max Richter and Dina Washington is more commonly referred to as the Shutter Island theme than it is referred to by its actual name. I really believe that Shutter Island and The Shining are both better off because they chose to use pre-existing music rather than having a composer create a version of the temp score that was, as Horner put it, written sideways. And as for 2001, my thoughts on that will be saved for another day. The next thing Horner talked about was ghostwriters. Horner says that he has to be very careful when talking about this. Then he says that doing exactly what Hans Zimmer does is a problem. He does not use Zimmer as an example, but he describes Zimmer's exact practices. First, he says that some people create their music on a synthesizer or something similar. Then they have someone else write the orchestrations. The orchestration is such a huge part of what the piece is that it's on par with drawing a picture then letting someone else color it in. He says he writes 60 to 70% of his own orchestrations, then usually is forced to hand it over to someone else due to time constraints. Then he says that the men who were nominated for Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, and Mary Poppins should not have been nominated because they write the main themes, then hand the music off to other writers or orchestrators who then do the work of shaping and applying the theme to a scene. This is exactly what is done by Zimmer and his team at Remote Control Productions. Like, exactly. Horner says that he understands the practice, but feels these scores should not be allowed to compete alongside fully original pieces that were crafted by one person. Apparently, there used to be two other kinds of awards for score, including Best Adapted Score. He is in favor of these awards, but reaffirms that he has a huge problem with these songwriters being given more credit than the orchestrator. To hear this stance from such a prolific composer, whose music I adore, makes me consider that I took the wrong stance. Maybe Zimmer and his practices are ruining music. But to return to their defense, 
there is a difference listed right on the score for the movies like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast. All the movies from the Disney Renaissance say, quote, music by Alan Menken, end quote. This is true, but all the movies had either Howard Ashman, Tim Rice, or Stephen Schwartz working as lyricists and creating the songs with Menken. Even then, the songs were still handed off to other orchestrators, arrangers, and producers who helped to get the final score. All of them are listed in the credits. Hans Zimmer is one of the only composers I can find who actually lists these collaborators under the category Additional Music by. The fact that he gave more credit to these people is the only reason attention has been drawn to him. In the article previously mentioned on outliers.co, Zimmer discusses all these different credits and how they are all important to the score. He also states that he is the main architect, and I agree. Everything the other team members do is based on the initial work of Zimmer. If he didn't craft a theme, they would have nothing to orchestrate, arrange, or produce. They're all important. They're all just doing their job the best they can. Returning to my initial conclusion, Zimmer did not ruin movie music. We and the filmmakers ruined the movie music. My next point in this afterward is a continuation of this point. Perhaps it's not just we who ruined movie music, but also the classical composers of our time. If you take a look at today's classical music, there are two trends, minimalism and covers. Minimalism, for the most part, started in the 1960s and really hit its height with composers like Philip Glass. But it's still going. Now into what's called post-minimalism. The problem is, post-minimalism should have ended around 2000. Instead, music just kind of never moved on. If you visit the Wikipedia page for classical music, contemporary, meaning current, classical music started around 1950. Minimalism and postmodernism both began around 1960. Postminimalism began in 1980. And there's just nothing after that. It's as if classical music stagnated at this stage. Wikipedia shows a chart breaking down classical music, its eras, and each era's composers. The chart shows we are still in the postmodern era. They didn't even log postmodernism, perhaps because it's not over. Or perhaps because there are only eight composers worth noting who are still working, five of which are composers who are credited with creating minimalism. These being Penderecki, who just passed away, Part, Reich, Glass, and Adams. All of these composers are nearing the end of their careers, and no young composers have innovated or invented anything beyond the post-minimalist stage. Writer Kyle Gann describes the characteristics of post-minimalism music as follows. Number one, a steady pulse, usually continuing through a work or movement. Number two, a diatonic pitch language, tonal in effect, but avoiding traditional functional tonality. Number three, a general evenness of dynamics without strong climaxes or nuanced emotionalism. Four, unlike minimalism, an avoidance of obvious or linear formal design. So basically, it's just formless background noise. Repetitive, directionless, emotionless, and all over the place. If film music has always copied classical music, and it has, then how does that translate? Well, it means that the stagnation and lack of innovation is killing film music by giving it nothing to follow. In fact, one of the only living composers doing any innovating is Hans Zimmer. He's the only one who has stepped up and done something new. So he's actually the hero here. I've been trying for some time to find new composers who are doing something besides post-minimalism, and I've had no luck. For this essay, I decided to take another look. I primarily focused on two Apple Music playlists, these being Contemporary Classical and Classical Edge, the latter of which is supposed to be the innovations in music. This is what I found. Number one, today's classical rarely conveys any specific mood. Different people listening could interpret different things because there is no clear push in any one direction. The only mood I personally got was sad, which leads me to number two. 
almost all of it has a depressing vibe. So much so that I think the playlists should have been called Contemplating Suicide and Music to Hang Yourself To. Number three, since it doesn't have a clear push in any direction, there is rarely ever a clear melody. Therefore, almost none of the tracks are memorable or easily identifiable. Too often, one track just blends into the next, even when by completely different artists. Speaking of artists, anything by new artists is almost all piano and or string based, adding to the fact that it all sounds the same. If there are any new compositions that incorporate more than piano, strings, and maybe a synthesizer, which is usually just used to add a tonal pulsing noise, then they suffer from at least one of the following problems. A. They are hard to find because they are credited to an orchestra rather than a composer. B. It still feels like it's following minimalism in the sense that there is rarely a clear melody or push in one emotional direction. The pieces are bland and forgettable. C. They aren't new. They're just new arrangements of old songs. And this leads us to the sixth thing I found. Number six. Across the board, there is a disproportionate amount of covers. Almost all the work by every single modern classical music artist is a cover of pre-existing music. Then this leads to number seven. The only thing that seems to be a glitter of hope is a classical crossover. Apple Music doesn't even have a classical crossover playlist. So for this, I moved to YouTube Music. Classical crossover is where classical music is mixed with pop elements, usually there is one artist who specializes in an instrument. Then an arrangement is written for them, which pushes them to play at their best and incorporates things like dubstep, rock, or pop instrumentations. Examples are Lindsey Sterling, Black Violin, The Piano Guys, Two Cellos, and Tina Guo. Tina Guo is actually Hans Zimmer's go-to cellist. She's the one who performs electric cello on the epic Wonder Woman theme. She also played in the revolutionary score, Inception. If the first two Dark Knight films were the path to the throne, Inception was the score that anointed Zimmer king of the modern minimalist score. It's one of the scores, along with many of his other works, that have been repeatedly copied. After all this, my new conclusion is that Hans Zimmer not only did not ruin movie music, he saved it. Michael Giacchino's scores are beautiful and always remind you of John Williams. But he can't write a melody as complex as John Williams. In fact, the only composer since Williams who can write new complex melodies was Horner. He could not escape the temp score and was so committed to treating the art form like a painter whose work appears to evolve in a clear series with each piece slightly resembling the last that much of his work is criticized for self-plagiarism. For almost every James Horner theme, you can find it occurring again in a different score. It would be nice to have people like him who can write all their own material, including orchestrations. But maybe the way to go is the way Zimmer went. The way of the Disney score, in which there are levels to the creative process. One or more people devote their time to devising strong melodies that represent themes and other elements of the story. Then other producers, arrangers, composers, and conductors are brought in to flesh out the score and apply it to the movie under Hollywood's grueling time constraints. They can even bring in amazing soloists like Tina Guo to add even more nuance. The result could be an amazing career like Zimmer's, full of different melodies, themes, and motifs that are easily identifiable, evocative, and have defined the last 20 plus years of movie music. In conclusion, Movie music has always followed classical music. Classical music has stagnated in post-minimalism. The movies are temp scored with Hans Zimmer music, then adapted by composers who all sound like Hans Zimmer. But Zimmer did not ruin movie music. He saved it by showing us the success found in his method of focusing on strong motifs and themes, then utilizing the talent of collaborators. He showed us a new path a path that can utilize different people in one score, stop following the shadow of classical music, and allow all different people to work and function in the cutthroat business that is movie scoring. However, it will only work if the musical artists can use this method to create new, unique sounds and convince the filmmakers to use it. 
I really hope they do. To everyone out there, thank you for listening or watching. I hope you enjoy the review and be sure to let me know what movie we should talk about next time.